All right, hey everybody, this thing should be live. We should have audio. This, I'd like, let me just take a minute and welcome everybody to the first ever live stream of the Space Junk Podcast. Right next to me is Dustin Gibson, my co-host. How you doing, man? Good, good. It's strange being able to see all this stuff. You know, I know for the first time. Audio only. Yeah, the yeah. first time. We've talked about this a long time, but here we are. Yeah, yeah. Now we're finally doing it. I'm streaming on my YouTube channel, Deep Astronomy, as well as uh, twitch.tv slash Gibson Picks. And I put a, in the little shot Chiron things, or whatever you want to call it, is uh, is uh, Dustin's Instagram handle, at Gibson Picks. So you definitely want to follow that because immediately, well, not immediately after, but soon after, we're both going to be live streaming on his Instagram channel as soon as we're done with this. And I guess right yeah, now like we're waiting on his mat. We're waiting on our guest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got a pretty pretty fancy spaceship there in the background. Oh, you like that? Yeah, that's is, my, uh, that's my background. That, yeah. Is that your design? Did no, you design no, that? I don't. I no, I ripped it off from somebody. I, I, uh, I tell you what it was. <laughs> I tell you what it was. It was the background. It was a screensaver to my Linux operating system. Uh, I have Pop OS, and that was the background. I liked it so much, I put it on the, on the background of the stream. So that's what it's from. It reminds me of a '70s. You can't see it all because we're in the way, but it reminds me of a '70s um, spaceship, uh, like the Jetsons or something from a cartoon. So anyway, I see you guys. Uncle Bill, yeah. I see you on my channel, and Adam, and Adam Synergy, and Galaxia. Welcome, guys. It's good to have you joining us. We are, like I said, just we're right now, just treading water, waiting on Matt. I, I noticed you put my name above your image, so like always, taking credit. Yeah, for, for your stuff. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, that's where it sort of was. <laughs> and if, if I had more control over <laughs> Zoom, I could arrange all the people and where they ought to go. But Zoom puts you where you're going to yeah, go, and that's the way it is. Uh, I know. I know. It's challenging. <laughs> I, I run into that with the uh, with the Twitch stream each night. Zoom, it's like the best tool ever and one that you can think, like, why wouldn't you just add this little level of control to make <laughs> this go a little smoother? So I have 15 people on there, man. And then, you know, literally zero control once they're in. It's like, yeah, well, yeah. okay. I know. And then you get, at least when I do my hangouts, I get everybody nicely shot and I get the frame configured and everything else. And then when they leave the hang the the meeting for whatever reason or they turn their camera off thinking they don't need to leave it on everything gets all screwed up because everything rearranges yeah. cuz i use the gallery view and the gallery view is uh you know gets all messed up if somebody doesn't use your camera so that's that's more information you guys yep. wanted to know about doing hangouts but. man we uh we were running the twitch stream last night so third rock astronomy i see you're here congratulations on winning yesterday yeah i um, saw that on the discord so server so we did a yeah, 50 bucks. We said, uh, look, if we get more than 100 people in here tonight just watching this processing with Brave Falls, how to process and fix insight, then we'll uh, we'll give away a $50 OPT gift card. Five minutes later, Skyly has rated us with 160 people. <laughs> 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 look, all right. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, so if you guys are watching on YouTube, you definitely need to go over and check the stream on Twitch. Uh, it's twitch.tv slash Gibson Picks, and it's all... It's every night. It's every night. So you definitely want yeah, to check it out. Every single night we've been doing it. Yeah. We haven't really, the only days we've missed have been, uh, you know, the internet problems that I feel like the entire country's been having. We, we got a couple of nights where we got hit by internet problems. Yeah. But then uh, the only other nights are when I go out to the observatories to install new equipment and things like that, you know, so literally traveling. And even then, I did some streaming from the observatories to show how big these systems really are because it's hard to tell in just a little nest camera window. But when you're out there looking up at this thing that's 11 feet tall, you know, it really puts it into perspective. Yeah, you need a mannequin there that's in life size so you can see, you know, to scale, right? Like they have in the, whenever, you, whenever you're not there, you have some mannequin standing there so you can so they can get an idea of just how big it is. Maybe even have them looking through the eyepiece. That would be really creepy, actually. Hey, James. <laughs> so listen, I, I, this is kind of an experiment, but one thing I want to say is that if we're going along with the podcast, we're going to start recording as soon as Matt shows up. And once we start recording, uh, and if we see something that you guys want to ask about, you know, we can maybe work that into the, to the episode. So I'm hoping that this kind of becomes a little more interactive as we go on. Let me get over to your chat. Yeah. Let me see where the people are. My, my. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it can. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, in my yeah. chat now. Haskins, Dustin, uh, and Tardigrades there. Yeah, A-Mitty. Okay. Yeah. Cool, yeah. man. 
Yeah, so this is always the part, uh, this is what happens that you don't hear on the podcast, but just getting everything set up, getting everybody in, getting sound checked, and uh, making sure that everything works right with the podcasting software, but this happens every uh, every meeting, yeah, did... and there's Matt joining now. Oh, good. Let me... Let me uh... So, not the Zoom meeting yet, just the, uh, the podcast. All right. Are you there, Matt? Are you there, Matt? Hey, guys. Can you hear me? We can hear you, can hear you. but there's a All bit right, of an cool. echo. Bit of an echo. So, so uh, can, you can you put on some headphones? Um, hmm. I have my studio mic in front of me, so let me figure out how to do that. It's just when I talk. Yeah, I'm not sure if mine is doing it. Yeah, mine's doing it too. Uh, I think it, you can click. Okay, it says, do I want to enable audio playback? It's asking me to click. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Testing, testing. No, I still hear it. <laughs> Adam altogether says, I'm in both chats, so I'm neutral. <laughs> in my chat, they're saying, so is it us against them then? <laughs> yeah, man. Who's, who's, let's get the highest chat rate. <laughs> The highest nice chat, chat rate. rate. All right, All right everybody, everybody, spam, spam my, my chat. chat. <laughs> hey, man, I'll take, hey, whatever, I'll I take whatever I can get. Uh, you just got a nice yeah, comment. Your podcast, podcast is awesome. awesome. It's what got me into all of this. Hey, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. It is a lot of work carrying Tony through these podcasts. You have no idea how tired I am after. I know. I'm trying to lose weight. The weight of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Panther's doing great, Peter. He's right here on the floor, actually. I'd show you to him, but my only my, I'm using the Panther cam right now. It's the only camera I've got that works. Yeah, we got Muffin running around in here, too, so he's probably going to make an appearance. <laughs> I'm glad that you run all of this stuff on your end for the podcast, Tony, because I can tell you, man, just the Twitch stream alone, I've got three big monitors in here, and every single inch of monitor real estate is taken up doing that Twitch thing, yeah. and it's still not enough. I still have tabs behind tabs trying to keep it all going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what I'll do is, Matt, is Matt, if all you're doing is getting a set of headphones, that's all you're going to need because you can still use your mic. Okay, what do the what do the headphones do? Because I mean, all I have, I well, let's they see. Prevent, they prevent they prevent the vo our voices, our voices from coming out through your speaker, speaker because they're just because we're just getting feedback. Oh, oh, so, oh, that's right. Okay, so, so just put on that set of he headphones, earbuds, anything, and uh, you, that ought to do it. Well, let me try. Yeah, that's all it is. We just can't have the computer speakers going. Right. right. That's all. And then if um, if you have a webcam, you're welcome to jump into the Zoom meeting too, man. Everybody okay. in the thing would be able to see you. All right, let me. Yeah, let me put on my Bluetooth headphones and see if those work. Yeah, go for it. We got time. In the All meantime, right. uh, I'd like to know what my chat thinks about Tony's spaceship design. So he actually he made this himself. He uh, he drew this. And colored it with color pencils. I'd like to know what you guys think about the spaceship design as our background here. He said that if he could design one to scale that had every realistic feature and button, this is what it would be. All right, let me see if what I can show. Think? I'll see if I let me show it to you. There it is, right there in its fullness. That is it. That's what you can't see. Yeah, if I were going to live in a in a in a spaceship, it'd be this. All I need is like Rosie the robot, you know, being in there, and then I'd be set. 
And I love it, uh, man. It, that kind of uh, thing is. I love that stuff, man. I love those old retro things. So, yeah, that's the yeah, background yeah, for sure. So no chairs, I notice. Standing only on Tony's spaceship. Nope. Let's get to work, man. You got to work. Uh huh. Those are those are very oversized buttons. <laughs> well. <laughs> 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 okay matt i just uh unmuted you and i don't hear an echo so that's good if can you guys how about this is this better you are five by five that's awesome it sounds great okay cool perfect All right. thank you no echo on my end either so let me get the zoom now Tesco. and when you do get into zoom mute everything don't have any out don't have any audio going just the video okay let me just one step at a time here. So I thought I'd open this up. <laughs> <laughs> no, all of it at once, man. <laughs> all of it at once. Uh, test computer audio. It just shows waiting for the host to let me into the meeting. Oh, well, that would be me. That's um, Tony's stand, job. Stand by. Oh, I have to do a really awkward thing here. Hold on. What? Uh, stand by. I have to, so, have, to do I have to pull the Zoom meeting back <laughs> over here and admit oh. you. Oh. All right. You should gotcha. be admitted. And there you are. See him. All right, cool. There he is. Okay, so I don't need to do anything with this phone audio, right? All this is no, good. you're sounding with computer. You're sounding great. Okay, cool. All right. Perfect. Now I'm going to start the podcast recording. Are you guys ready? Yep. Whether you are or not, it's starting. We are ready. All right, we're, we're doing we're, this. We got it. So we tried last week and broke it. This week it's fixed, <laughs> and we're live streaming for the first time. So it's working. Yeah. So welcome, Matt Dietrich. So tell tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. You're a photographer. I know this. I've seen. I've watched some of your videos on your YouTube channel. Which, by the way, if you're watching the live stream, I put the link to his channel on the in the description box. So check out his uh, his YouTube channel as well. Yeah, happy to hang out with you guys and apologize about last week. This is all new experience to jump on podcasts, but I think it's incredible what you guys are doing for the community and just uh, all of us, I think, are like-minded. Yeah, definitely, man. Your work, like, I, I follow your photos, and every time you post this stuff, for one thing, you are traveling to some of the, the most amazing, for an astron astronomer, the dream locations of the world. You know, installing literally dream telescopes, you know, and then the, the time lapses and the stuff you're doing from like Chile and all of this. It is like it is so amazing the work that you've been doing. And I know your social media following has been growing because of that. But does it feel that way? Are you living the dream with Plane Wave right now? I mean, I think that's been, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the kind comments, number one. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is stuff I've dreamed about for you know, since I was young, you know, under 10 years old. And I think maybe a lot of us can relate to that of getting introduced to astronomy and the night skies at a young age. And I've always just wanted to share that with people and enjoying the night sky. Uh, it's like, it's like getting a fast car. You want to get one faster and faster each time you upgrade. And for astronomers, you want to get to darker and darker night skies. And you know, some of the best skies I've seen are, you know, even in the U S you know, some of the national parks, but Chile is kind of a that that was a bucket list place for me um, ever ever since watching documentaries on the Atacama Desert and, and the big right. telescopes that they put in at those elevations. Um, it's just a different environment. Uh, but you know, anywhere we go on these work trips, everyone is so friendly. Um, you know, you always kind of hang out, have food. Um, you know, enjoy each other's company. Uh, talk about astronomy and, and understand different cultures. I think that's one of the coolest things that um, last year really uh, was for, for Plane Wave and the installations we had. We was, you know, I was on 17 installs, I think, in the course of nine months. So it was it was a busy season. So you work for Plane Wave? Correct. Okay. All right. I, I did, thought your identity was primarily as a as a photographer, and I did not know that. So uh, no, that, that's actually secondary. That's that's what produces all of this is traveling for the plane wave stuff most of the time, right? That's how a lot of this goes in installing not the small stuff, but like big one meter telescopes and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Last year we had a big backlog of one meter telescopes to install, so we did. Uh, we even went from one install, um, I mean, we did two one meters within 
literally a week and a half, I think. You know, we went from one in New Mexico uh, over to, I think, Toronto. So we had a backlog to get installed, but um, we installed quite a few, you know, 24 inch telescopes as well. Some of the, the smaller ones <laughs> for us, but, uh, you know, in some of the 17s. Yeah, well, that's the amazing thing about uh, Plane Wave, though, is that you're making telescopes that can be installed in such a short amount of time. I mean, to be able to do two telescopes in a week and a half never would have been possible on that scale without Plane Wave doing everything it's done over the last five years. Yeah, the the I mean, all said and done, the one meters, if if we you know don't run into any roadblocks and our procedures have gotten really refined over the course of last year with what we need in the tool toolkit and the the pre-site checklist that we implemented you know we can have those things up and running within 10 hours uh you know on sky wow. taking images the one meters and you know it's a long day and um you know some of those installs turn into you know 14 15 16 hour long days but you know it's some of the hours blend together when we just try to get everything you know, installed and running, but, uh, it's hard to complain. I try to pinch myself. It's, it, it's hard to sometimes do that when it, you do it for the living, but, um, I still try to have those, you know, emotional connections to the night sky while you're there, whether in Chile or, um, you know, here in the U S or anywhere else. Yeah, you know, I don't, uh, when, when you first started with Plane Wave, I saw you many times, um, you know, everywhere. We end up at a lot of the same places, but I saw you even at Plane Wave's headquarters back when it was in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a new facility out there in Michigan. And um, I haven't been yet. I was supposed to actually be there right before yeah. this hit. And uh, man, the things I've heard about the, the new Plane Wave facility is that it's just gorgeous, just huge. Yeah, man, you'll definitely have to come out, and uh, it's a nice small town. Uh, you know, we got 50 acres of land there, and have renovated all the main buildings that we need to, you know, produce optics, to test optics, a separate building for developing and testing the mounts, and we have separate main building for just the the offices as well. So um, there's not a shortage of space like there was any, um, you know, anymore where where we were at in Los Angeles. So it's, it's positive that we have a lot of land to grow on and the community has been fully welcoming to it. So it's, um, it was a natural fit. How big is the company? How big is plane wave as a company itself employees and all of that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think right now we're, we're still between, uh, I think 50 to 65 employees, I believe as of right now. And, uh, We've grown steadily over the last, well, actually since they started over the last, you know, 14 years or so. I think they started in 2000, 2006. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and. Yeah, it's been explosive growth over the last few years, though. And, um, you know, it's a. Uh, we do a lot of work together, and I can tell you that Plane Wave makes, I mean, some of the best telescopes in the world. I actually have a 17 inch Plane Wave in mm -hmm. my observatory. And, you know, I think it's an interesting point you were making a second ago, and I want to I ask you a little bit more about that. But, um, the, you know, doing this as a career, I get this question all the time, and you just kind of touched on it, but I want to know a little deeper. Doing this as a career, I always get asked, does it diminish? my desire to do this as a hobby? Like, do I still want to get out under dark skies? Do I still want to shoot? And I can say the honest answer for me is it amplifies it because mm -hmm. I have access and it's never diminished it at all. Um, does it do the same for you or, or what's your experience been like on that? Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, I, I try to have those, you know, pinch me moments where if we're installing a system somewhere, just to realize that, you know, I'm sitting next door to where I used to, you know, try film astrophotography through a Mead 80 millimeter, you know, when I was in ninth grade, literally that's, that's what I started right in the side lawn. Um, and just picturing what, what we do as a team now and as an industry and how quick systems can be installed. That's, that's the pinch me aha moments that definitely keep me, uh, motivated, especially during the long days. So like you said, I mean, you're doing something that you love and you want to share it with other people. And that's, that's one thing to be able to combine it with, uh, you know, the night sky photography for me, that's, that's an absolute dream and a passion because I want more people to be involved in this. So one of the things that I've noticed, I mean, for sure, plane wave produces research quality 
instruments, right? I mean, these are mm-hmm. things that can be used and are used by both professionals and, and amateurs alike. But I was, w- I'm wondering how much of your um, sales or customer base are, is it kind of evenly split between the amateur community and the professionals, or is it mostly professionals, or is there any way to? I mean, can you give us some insight on who's using yeah. your scopes? Yeah. So I mean, we. The fact is that we've had new industries reach out to us because of the optical quality of the telescopes and the mounts that are actually holding the telescopes to track the night sky. So, I mean, we still have a lot of universities and colleges. Uh, We have the private market, which is, you know, us as imagers, astrophotographers. And then we have defense, you know, military organizations. Oh, wow. We have you know, commercial entities that are needing to track satellites and the mounts are capable of tracking satellites, you know, for space uh, situational awareness and laser communication. So those are the, you know, the three main markets that our equipment is uh, currently applicable for. And, you know, we'll see as, you know, uh, everything evolves the next decade on um, what new industries come up where plane wave will, you know, pivot and evolve and apply our equipment. Too. And so t- the uh, optical systems that you make, uh, that you manufacture, uh, just like the mirrors and the, the optical elements, mm-hmm. are those made in-house or are they manufactured somewhere else to your standards? Uh, how are, or do you have your whole, or is it all like vertical integration, all from the mount to the secondary? Yeah, yeah. Everything is made in-house, you okay. know, figured, polished, and, uh, you know, tested in-house. Full system, you know, uh, throughput, we always provide instead of just on one mirror basis. So uh, clients know the optical quality of each system before it leaves. And we have a strict, uh, you know, QA, quality assurance, and QC, quality control procedure for testing before anything even leaves the facility. So I mean, we're able to keep costs low because of the vertical integration. So we're basically... Uh, you know, if you want an analogy, you could say, you know, the Henry, Henry Ford model, you know, we're a serial production manufacturer and that's how we can create such high quality at, um, you know, still an affordable price to the discerning amateur and, you know, commercial entity. And it's the whole package it's the mount, all of it. I mean, that's the whole shebang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is now? Yeah. yeah that, that was revolutionary when, when the L mount dropped, I mean, it changed everything because now you've got this direct drive mount that's as affordable as what the other premium mounts already were that were geared mounts but you just eliminated the problem of backlash and periodic error with one mm-hmm. swipe right and so um, yeah. you know let's let's talk about that was that uh was that kind of the the turning point for for you i know you you do a lot of the installs of the l mounts don't you yeah, yeah. Last year we had quite a few, and you know, I, I joined Plane Wave exactly two years ago. I would have would have been jumping on the team, and we've done a lot of uh, L mounts since then. But you know, my my first install with them, obviously, I was I was daunted to be like, wait, how do how does this thing work? But um, yeah. you know, after a few hours spending it with a software, you really see how intuitive um, the software is and the equipment, because it'll just kind of blend away into the background while you're taking photos. And in my experience, that's one of the most, um, beneficial things about plane wave where you, you expect quality and the equipment just works. Yeah. You really want the software to just get out of the way. Honestly, yeah. you don't want to be thinking about the software. That's the best yeah. software in my opinion is the stuff you're not thinking about. Just get out of mm-hmm. the way and let me capture my data. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, yeah, and, and yeah. Yep. So well, do you absolutely. mind going into do you mind going into then uh for the people here that don't know, I'm sure there there are a lot of listeners that don't know, um, what's the difference in direct drive and traditional geared mounts? What's the difference and why does it matter? Yeah. So th- the biggest thing in for me, I mean I've taken apart many uh, geared mounts. So geared mounts, you you have cog wheels basically moving together, just machine pieces of metal. And you're always going to play in between those actual gears and you have to grease them. So they only can move at a certain speed and you have play within those gears. So there's ways to kind of fix that a little bit in software, but it's still a mechanical system where you can't control some of the some of the actual uh, errors in the gear. But with direct drives, you're, all you have is a, a motor and magnets. 
So there's no gears. All you have is a bearing that basically the, the axes are, are um, you know, sitting on the motors. So that allows the system to slew very quickly, quietly, and track objects at very high precision. And we go down to normally 0.05 to 0.15 arc second level tracking. I know that's getting into jargon, but um, all that means is if of a minute fraction of a width of a star in jitter, uh, essentially, or tracking error, I should say, not jitter. But um, you open yourself up to new applications with direct drive because of the speed the system can move and track at, such as satellite tracking and uh, extremely minimal maintenance and quiet. And, and that the tracking accuracy right now is, uh, you know, it's unmatched compared to gear systems because we can only machine gears to a, uh, a certain tolerance. Uh, but now with just using magnetism, you can control the system very precisely. So can I? That just means better photos. That's it. You know, better photos. <laughs> right. Those gears are dependent on mechanical friction to work, and even then, only a very small percentage of the gears around the cog are actually engaged at any one time. And so, with magnetism, I mean, you have complete control, and you're not dependent on that. So you can make these super fast slews mm -hmm. and not have the inside of the mount set on fire and reshape all the gears. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And so um, I've seen I've seen just the test demos. I don't know what your uh, posted um, slew speeds are, but I've seen when they were just testing the original ones before they were even sold. Man, yeah. these things were whipping around so fast you could reshape the optics. Like it was a problem of inertia <laughs> yeah. more than it was. They were doing that. At, yeah. They were doing that at Neef a year ago. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. 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 Well, can I yeah. make sure I'm understanding? I'm visualizing this right. So you've basically a direct drive drive is one that is basically built you've you've incorporated the polar axis into the motor itself right so the polar axis is the drive the drive of the shaft of the motor and then is it a continuous motor that's built around that or is it a stepper motor kind of thing or am i visualizing that right the that it is so built around the polar axis it's it's close so basically each you have to look at it um you have copper coils you have to look at it from i guess just a a cylinder a circle and you have all these magnets that are spaced on the annulus and then you have copper coils up above those so imagine taking a sandwich well i guess just a, uh, an oreo cookie and opening it up and basically on one side you have copper coils on the other side you'd have magnets and just a a circular track of magnets and you put those together and you know we do wiring on it so when you send electricity to the copper you're creating a magnetic field so and essentially oh. yeah and so and that is kind of a stepper-ish kind of motor then right because each coil and each magnet would interact in a very specific way like a stepper motor so i don't know if stepper motors can get down to the resolution with so basically we use optical encoders and an encoder just provides a, a feedback it's like the the um, um, cruise control in your car right you right. set it to a certain a certain speed and it's going to read sensors and it's going to say okay I see the wheels moving at this speed so I'm going to keep at this speed basically with the encoders we can say um, continue tracking at this speed and with the precision of the encoder you basically like I said so it's, it's the fraction of a width of a star so you get very pinpoint images without, um, you know, any issues from backlash or gears moving together because all you have is a bearing and a magnetic field. So it makes for a very um, high precision pointing and tracking system. Okay. All right. Um, so the... Uh I was just reading that my, my audio was starting to clip a little bit, so I'm turning it. was it, a little. You, you actually it. just got a, um, a question in the, the Twitch chat here. Okay. Um, Third Rock Astronomy is asking, um, are they absolute or relative encoders? So on the one meter system, we have absolute encoders. And on all the uh, you know, smaller systems, we use incremental. And the only difference between absolute and incremental, which I'm sure you, you likely know, is... If you power cycle them out, 
the absolute encoder is going to know where it is at even after you power cycled. But with the incremental, you have to run the quick, you know, five to 10 second homing procedure mm -hmm. and it'll then reference itself knowing exactly where it's at. So you save yourself yes. a lot of money. If we put uh, absolute encoders in, in the L mounts, you would jack the price up by multiple thousands. And, and it, all it does is save yourself five seconds, you know, five, 10 seconds it's during homing. It. It's, there's yeah, no it's need for it, it you know, it, yeah. for most, for most, uh, you know, the applications. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, I've seen people that one of the first exposures I saw off an L mount was one of my friends sent me an image. It was a 30 minute exposure in HA. And mm -hmm. it just said, ha, ha, ha. And I was like, what is this? And he said, unguided. And I was yeah. like, no, <laughs> yep, no. Oh, yeah. 30 yeah. minute unguided yeah. exposure. Yeah. That's insane. And it's not like he's shooting at 200 millimeters of focal length. This was with the plane wave, 12 and a half. Yeah. That's a lot of focal length. Yeah. You know, but that is just insane levels of tracking. Yeah. Yeah. We did an install a couple, well, it was in Jan or January, end of January in New Mexico. And it was this cool astronomy village in, uh, in Deming, uh, New Mexico. And one guy had an L500 with a 17 and he was doing unguided, uh, you know, 20, 25 minute subs. And I was asking him, you know, how many subs are you tossing away? Cause usually I would think, you know, maybe, you know, 15%, 20% of the subs. He said last night he did, you know, a hundred subs and he threw away one. So I, <laughs> it, oh, but he's, he's equatorial. So that's, I mean, that's the way to do it with the L mounts for astrophotography is put it up on a wedge and polar line it. And our software can help adjust the polar alignment. And we did one that weekend for the buddy and the polar alignment got down to, you know, five arc seconds in each axis of, of polar alignment error. And then that it's so, so incredible. Yeah. It's, it's simple and easy for that. that. Guided. I mean, I'm throwing probably 15% of my subs away right now guided mm. just due to, I mean, granted, you know, there are 15 and 20 mile an hour gusts out there in the yeah. desert right now. Yeah. So the wind, the wind doesn't help anything, but, um, yeah. Yeah, that, they truly are incredible, man. And I think that's why they've become so popular. I mean, they're so popular, as you know. We have to have 30 on hand. I think we have 30 L50s <laughs> on hand yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a popular mount. <laughs> yeah, I trailered one home from the shop uh, on Friday. So I, I got it out last night to do a little bit of imaging in, uh, with a C, C, uh, CDK-14. Um, clouds rolled in, but I still did the mosaic of the moon <laughs> with the high clouds. It looked kind of cool, but kind of kind of overkill to just roll out and do lunar shots. But it was yeah. it was too cloudy <laughs> to do a pointing model. What? But Look at my yeah, scope, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it's pretty fun. I, I would love to take that. My goal is to try to get something like that to take to some national parks and engage with more people and do some night sky uh, you know star parties like like I used to do at Mount Rainier back five years ago because. Man, we tell you what, how many people love seeing, uh, you know, seeing the night sky for the first time. We had, we had 90 year old, um, you know, people there at Mount Rainier, you know, that, uh, star party and things that never, never looked through a telescope, never saw a planet through a scope. It's, uh, and then all the way down to the kids, you know, doing astrophotography and the kids would put the phones, um, take the background of the images that we did and slap it on their phones and they would be showing their parents. It was, uh. It was just such a cool way to engage with people, and of course, we all can relate to that um, that kind of feeling of the night sky. That's a cool way to and get started, passion, looking through a right? plane so wave. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're going to go out to the park and not know that you're going to get a view tonight, and then there's somebody there with an L mount and a plane <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and showing yeah. the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, yeah. just sitting there in the parking lot. Just, yeah, as yeah. long as they help me roll it back in the trailer because I had to get help. But I, I got to find a way to put like a winch, get like a winch on the trailer or something like that so I can yeah. help like roll the rolling pier back inside. So it's it was a good learning curve last night to see if it's going to be practical for some, you know, some maybe trips like that for, for um, you know, outreach and education. Well, it's not practicality you should be after. It's just epic. Epic is the word you're going for, man. And it's <laughs> yeah. That. yeah. yeah. So, it, Makes a hell of yeah, a first impression. Uh, that's... Yeah, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. And that's the side of it that you're passionate about, man. And I really I really appreciate that about you and that you bring that to Plane Wave is the desire to share this. It makes it more than a business because you have huge not only outreach potential, but you put a ton of effort into it. You're sharing this with a lot of people. Um, is that kind of what keeps you here? Is that kind of keep, what, what keeps you in the hobby is is the sharing side of it? I think so. I think all of us can definitely relate to that. Um, 
you know, I, I want more young people to be involved in this hobby. And what I'm already starting to see from doing some some more social media work for Plain Wave is how many younger people are doing astrophotography globally. Uh, you know, 15 year olds in New Zealand. I mean, it's like for crying out loud, right. I, you know, I, and even younger. And the work that they're doing is I was like, dude, you need to like submit that to APOD and you know, magazines that the yep. the getting folks out there that's one thing that i love about plane wave that they're very open to ideas uh, and i think that's what made them successful is that they they're a good company and, and i came from oil and gas i mean my background is is geology and um in education as well and you know my idea was obviously to to help grow plane wave on the installation front but also on um, you know the education and outreach side and i think that's finally actually going to happen that's kind of the way um you know things are, are changing um you know once travel kind of opens back up you know yeah well i you know i called rick that's probably he probably called you after that call um i called rick rick's the ceo of plane wave and i was talking to him about it and i really like that it's exactly what you're saying rick is so open to all of this like if it's getting yeah. astronomy in front of people he's just like yep let's do it let's partner yeah. let's get after it let's let's show people and so yeah i know you have uh i know you have the support there and it looks like i mean if you've got the access yeah. to the equipment you've got the following you've got the know-how then all all that separates you know you from the goal of showing this to you know a huge number of people is just time mm -hmm. right yeah. it's just time yeah to exactly to yep yeah and that was i mean that's his bucket list stuff for me you know i i've wanted to drive you know and i drove to mount rainier to do that um, astronomy ranger position back five years ago about to the day i left in well mid-may but you know i spent you know two weeks driving hitting up national parks to check out and photograph <laughs> the nice sky you know, what was it? The first stop was uh, Badlands, uh, Badlands National Park. And that was the first time I ever photographed air glow. You know, the green and the and the the reddish. Uh, a lot of times here in the Northern Hemisphere, you get the green, green air glow. But the skies are so dark. Uh, you know, we stopped at Yellowstone for a night, but it was it was cloudy there. So we hung out at Glacier for five nights or so. And we had four nights in a row of clear, good, dark skies and um is glacier up in montana yeah yeah, yeah. yep okay. yep northern montana and that's some of the darkest night skies i've ever seen i mean you, you hand in front of your face you can't see it and it's kind of kind of scary because i mean you got well it was may so the grizzlies aren't coming out of their dens just yet but i was you know by myself just going around to some of those places and i'm like i'm gonna stay kind of closer to my car than i normally would and say other national parks but i don't want to be uh by myself with some grizzly bear comes looking for food after coming out of winter hibernation. <laughs> I'll bet, yeah. I, don't, I don't get yeah. that. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right about that. I mean, these, these, these mountain skies, I mean, the, the biggest downfall or the biggest negative about them, I guess, is they tend to be, they tend to have a lot of cloud cover and a lot of moisture, but boy, when you're up at yeah. altitude, um, I think it, it would, it would put anything, it would be better than anything you'd see in a desert, for example, which you know, you can get more consistent, uh, mm -hmm. awesome skies from, but man, those yeah. mountain skies, when they're clear like that and you're up at 5,000 yeah. or 8,000 feet, it's yep. unbelievable. Yeah. It's, yeah. No. Yeah. And that's, that is one of the coolest things. I, I do appreciate plane wave for just being open to ideas, especially from, you know, younger employees kind of thing, because it's so easy to dismiss, you know, ideas and then you miss out on, on opportunities and engaging with, um, you know, other sectors or, or business ideas that, you know, you might not have thought about. And, um, you know, I didn't think about it as a job switch. I mean, to me, this was finally getting a career and, you know, <laughs> I've been working for a while, but it's the first time I've said, I finally have a career that is, um, you know, something that I love and just want to share with, um, you know, like, like you guys, I mean, you're getting this, the, the word of mouth out and engaging with people. And, uh, I think that's super cool. You know, man, we that's... need more people to promote. That's true wealth, in my opinion. That makes you a rich man, right? To have that ability, to be able to say that about your life and your career, you know, that's just there's mm. just nothing like it. And I would hope, I would wish that on more people, just because it is such a an invigorating thing to have a, a career mm -hmm. that you look forward to and and uh, yeah. enjoy doing every single day. Is Plane yeah. is Plane Wave a young company? Are you guys full of harumphers? They well, let's see. <laughs> I mean, we got a good mix. We definitely do. That's a, that's an awesome term. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's definitely a good mix, right? But like I said, they they listen, and I say I'm young, but I mean I'm going to be 
29 on Sunday, but I mean, That's young. they joke, they joke about not, uh, the one engineer's joke is like, Oh yeah. They told me I wouldn't get to, I wouldn't be respected until I turned 30. That's what they told him dying, you know, laughing about that. It's like, okay, <laughs> once you're 30, then you're a competent, you know, engineer and that sort of thing, or you would be respected as an engineer. So, but, um, it's proofs in the pudding, man. If you, uh, if you work hard and, and that's all I did last year was like 200 and some days on the road for plane wave installing, doing, uh, marketing and conferences. And, um, that year was like a blink of an eye and it's, uh, we learned a lot and being in a field teaches you, you know, how to work with the equipment and resolve issues. I think that's just the life skills of astrophotography, you know, give someone a telescope and a camera and, and they'll, they'll be able to figure out, um, you know, art, science, you know, troubleshooting, oh, yeah, all everything. kind of cool engineering, you know. And I couldn't agree with you Access more. Access to everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the proof is in the doing for sure because you, you see this in these young astrophotographers coming out everywhere. The, the work is just absolutely stunning and expert level. Yeah. And uh, yeah. even, even in the science level, as far as getting respect goes, I mean, there's a guy, uh, a friend of mine, Mike, he's called Asteroid Hunters on, uh, on Twitch, and he mm. looks for asteroids. And he's got somebody working with him, a, a, a younger adult. I, I don't, I don't want to mention his name just in case. But anyway, yeah. he's, he's, uh, he, he can not only manipulate the data, but he can find asteroids that have been lost in the data and go back and find them again uh, so that they can be observed uh, from wow. professional data sets. And this kid hasn't even started college yet. And so these are, you know, these are people who, yes, have massive amounts of respect, even though yeah. they, you know, yeah. they just started. So I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't echo that sentiment more. I think it's important. Yeah. And it's amazing to me. And I don't know if that's because of technology being, uh, you know, enabling all of this or, or what. But it seems mm -hmm. to me like the young, the younger generation is really able to take this stuff and go with it. Yeah. What were you going to say, were, Dustin? Um, you, so you said 200 days on the road last year. You were in a lot of different countries. Did, did you keep you, track how many countries you went to last year? Yeah, and I did um, even... I mean, this is touching upon that, that trip five years ago, my, when I finished grad school for geology, my, my advisor was like, you know, it, you should, you should journal, you know, cause she knew I was going to go do this astronomy stuff. So, so she said, you know, you should journal that and pass it on, you know, to your grandkids or whatever. And I was like, well, why that my grandpa actually did that when he was in the Navy and stuff. And so I, I keep that same journal and I'll make just a, a blog or whatever, just something like okay, I'm in, you know, we, we were in Thailand in fall. We were in Chile a few times, uh, a lot in the U S um, where else Australia a few times. So, you know, I just make a note of it cause I think it'd just be cool to, you know, if I have kids one day, pass it on to them to be like, Oh, Hey, you know, I remember when we did this and inspire them hopefully to, to travel and experience new cultures. And, you know, we had a few, a few trips in Europe, um, you know, France and Switzerland and in Germany. So, yeah, I think the storytelling stuff, man, that's that's one of the coolest things that that I guess I've enjoyed about about it in the people. Right. Because um, I miss, you know, even just sitting at home, I, I miss being on the install trips, working with the people and and working with them to troubleshoot and find solutions. And, you know, you build these super quick relationships that last and you, you, you hang out with them, you text them and stay in touch. So that's, you know, it, it was one of the busiest years of my life. But, man, I. You know, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, that's amazing. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. So you've um, you've been spending a lot of time on mountains, man. I can tell. Is that that where the beard came from? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna grow it out even more, and we'll see. My my old roommate, his is like down here after he got married. He literally looks just like me, but he's got a West Virginia <laughs> accent from Southern West Virginia, and uh, he he saved it off before he got oh. married in in October, but. Um, it's been going since, and it's it is literally down. It's it's beautiful. That's, so yeah, it's kind of like a 12, yeah. 12, maybe fifteen pound beard. Does you have any? Uh, does it feel like yeah. a counterweight? I think Justin you know? Dustin has beard envy. <laughs> I just, man, it's just God, these beard oil. Man, here have these massive beard <laughs> oil beards. Yeah, it's important. We should yeah. just post a picture of all of the guests of Space Junk Podcast that have had beards of like yeah, yeah I ten think pounds or thing. heavier. Yeah, I think Hans yeah. is still got to beat, but yeah, he's, he has, that's that's some serious beardage there. Yeah, for sure. I was trying to figure out names because I, I was figuring out what I should do for. Uh, 
on the side, like I do all the photography and stuff. And, you know, I finally incorporated as an LLC as a bucket list thing finally. And, but I was like, you know what, I, should I just change it and not just do Matt Dierick photography? But it, right now it is just that, but I was joking. It's like, should I do like bearded Astro or I don't know something, but I couldn't figure <laughs> out a catchy enough name because it's like, well, what if I shave it or what if it like, yeah, yeah, if I get rid of it one day, then it's like, well, that's kind of odd. But I was I was figuring yeah. out all of these lists of like business names I should do, but I couldn't, you know, I was spending too much time on that and on actually just figuring out a business model, <laughs> right? Like I I, I just want to, you know, work on that. And star not just beard, a man. It used to be star yeah. beard, right? Instead of black beard and, and all these the glitter the beards. Yeah, glitter. Yeah, star beard. <laughs> yeah. Right? That, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah. derailed. It always yeah. happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> derailed. So, what did, you said you went to you went to grad school for uh, geology? Yeah, geology and planetary sciences is, is what it was back then. So, finished that okay. five years did ago. Go, did you go all the way through the PhD program, or just did the masters? Um, I, I realized, you know, I thought it'd be cool to teach maybe one day, but I found out that you know it's the passion, anytime I was doing all those programs, I was always still figuring and dreaming something night sky related. And that's why I was like, you know, masters is going to be enough for what I want to do. And obviously, you know, I'm not working on geology right now anymore anyway. So, but, uh, yeah, I give credit to people that push through for PhDs cause that's, that's a long haul. So you must yeah. be following oh, the, uh, the, the Rover stuff on Mars and all the, all the geologic news that comes out of Mars pretty closely then. That stuff's crazy. It's 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 amazing all the chemistry and, and geology that they work on, but it's it's cool. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff we could do on uh, you know, you reference stuff like that on planet Earth to, you know, you know, like gypsum is like a mineral and we only know it forms when it's um, in contact with water. And they found that on Mars. So, you know, you can make you know, deduce that basically Mars had water, obviously, and there's way other, you know, the fact that you have all those sedimentary rocks as it is, that's we only know that that forms in water. So there's cool terrestrial analogs, as they call them, you know, for planetary science that you can look at. You know, it's pretty cool. Definitely. And um, can I just ask you about your the install in Chile? Because you have a beautiful video on your channel uh, about how that install went. And it mm -hmm. brought back a lot of memories because I, I spent some time on that same mountain, the Cerro Tololo, uh, mm -hmm. where they have this complex of observatories uh, yeah. The biggest of which is the four meter Blanco that's in the big dome that you see in your video. Yep. And uh, I was just curious about what they're going to do. This was in one of the auxiliary buildings that's around the rim of the of the hilltop. And yeah. what what did they? What is their plan for? Is it going to be a general purpose telescope, or do they have any specific surveys in mind with that telescope? Uh, what's the plan for it? <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's one of our clients. Uh, that's actually the U.S. Navy. And oh, is that a Navy they're doing, building? That's okay. a naval, yeah. And that's they're doing uh, what they called celestial reference framing. So, you know, they're doing that. So basically doing, framing. yeah. So okay. I'd imagine it might have some, um, they have a wide field camera on it, right? But there's, you know, if it's the Navy, there's probably some interesting applications that I have no clue what their, you know, the uh, defense application might be for it. But um, that's, that's what I know the actual uh, celestial reference frame uh, application is, well, is the primary focus of that system right now. I celestial reference frame every day and I don't even need a telescope for that. So I'm not quite I know. Sure. They, well, yeah. they got a one meter to do it. So I guess they, <laughs> yeah. they just so they can do off. it better. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they can do it better. Yeah. yeah. Well, people don't realize just how involved the military is in astronomy, uh, especially in things like space weather. The Air Force has a huge contingent working at NASA mm. Goddard where they're looking at the sun all the time. They want to know about the dangers of these storms that are coming from the yeah. sun. Sure. And, and Navy, I would imagine, are more interested. I would uh, celestial reference framing. It must be navigation of some kind. Uh, that yeah, they're using it for. But yeah, uh, exactly. Sense, I suppose. Yeah, very precise. I guess that's astrometry then. It, right? Yeah, it would you be. Know? So they're although it would be from that. Well, so yeah, um, I, we can speculate, but who yeah. knows what that means? Because they have big catalogs. I mean, that old telescope they used to use. I mean, they have you know the USNO catalog kind of thing for uh, like plate solving. Right. So mm -hmm. they have a big database for that, for fingerprinting, you know, where the telescope's pointing in the night sky. Yeah. It's just that they've got Gaia now for that. And so I just wonder, 
Yeah, mm. you know, but it's it's cool that they've got it there. And I did not know that that was a multinational hilltop. You know, it's, it's it, the the name of the organization that runs it is CTIO, which is Cerro Tololo Interagency or Inter yeah Interagency American yeah Inter American Inter American yeah. yeah yeah Inter American Observatories. And so I guess that makes sense that there would be other countries involved. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. How they have the food? best food. Don't they though? <laughs> there, I their know. cooks, and their the, the salmon. Ca- oh man, yeah, and, is. <laughs> and it's so cool. And dude, doesn't so it so does. neat? You get to not only do you get to eat breakfast at like three in the afternoon, right? Because you you've slept all day, and these really <laughs> yeah, yeah. and these really cool um, apartments that uh, that have the uh, light shades that come down, and man, it is dark in there. You go to sleep yeah. at I don't know six or seven in the morning, and wake up again around three ish. And you know, it's like you're. It's an. It, it takes like a day to get your schedule all screwed up like that, and you then. Yeah. And it's but it's wonderful. It's really it's really great, and you're right. The food there is awesome. It's really good. Uh, I definitely won't forget that. That's. <laughs> I think we we have to go back down there. Well, hopefully, we were supposed to go in March to to just work on the system and do some more training for them. And um, but I think maybe July or August we'll go back down, depending on like flights and schedules and things. So. I have to wonder in this day and age now, with the way things are going with the with the pandemic, if 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 remote observing isn't going to be more of an of a thing. I mean, astronomers mm. would go to the hilltop, but if you think about it, they didn't really have to be there other than to supervise their observations. Yeah, uh, I just wonder how much that's going to be hurt going forward. But that's you know, I, I guess yeah. we'll tell. Do you yeah. do that, Matt? Do you do you do your own? Um you know, remote imaging regularly with all with a lot of these different systems you build. So the one, I mean, the one. So Obstech, if, if for those who aren't familiar with that, and I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions about that facility because we have a few. That's becoming like Plane Wave Central down there at Obstech in Chile. So basically, that's just a few miles south of Cerro Tololo. So you have the same, you know, usually one arc second level seeing, and sometimes it does dip down to 0.8 arc second level seeing. Uh, but it's a, this beautiful facility that, that has, I mean, now they're, they're over, over 50 remote systems. And, uh, we have a client that has a CDK 600 there and, uh, we'll be putting our CDK 24 and an L 600 down there as well that we'll be using, uh, you know, for doing satellite tracking and, you know, imaging and, and trying to find ways to do some marketing and things like that with it. So I, I can't wait to get that thing set up and, and up and running. So that's, that's the that's one that uh, the client lets me on whenever he's not using it. Like tonight, he said he's busy, so I'll just do some narrowband data because of the moon. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that, that's incredible, man. And, and I know you have to have – yeah, I mean, if people – if you're building these things and they're not going to be used every single night, that's an mm-hmm. awesome way to get some time on these big telescopes. It's just yeah. if it's not being used. I mean, same thing we do. Like we, we open ours up to everyone to use yeah. you know but that's it's a little bit different because that's kind of the point of the ones we're building but that's yeah thing we exactly need to talk about we need to we need to get you involved in this observatory project we have going on and yeah. uh you know it's a an awesome way for you to do outreach and open up the observatories to you and even even the twitch channel itself man i mean we can make that mm. available for you to to educate people because mm. it's a lot of fun and the whole point of it is just to let people access the universe for themselves yeah, and to train them how to use this stuff so that they can use the Texas observatories um, for free, you know? So it's, it's a really cool hangout thing on Twitch. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that you guys are doing that and I know it just there's so many young kids you guys are reaching. I think it's just so cool. And, um, you know, I guess that's one of the things of figuring out what route I kind of want to take with, um, with it. Cause you know, we're, we're a mid-sized company, I guess, or small mid size, whatever you'd say. But, um, you know, still there, I guess it ebbs and flows with how busy installs get. But now with right. being at home and not traveling for installs, you know, I've been pushing to do more of the marketing side and, and just engaging with people and, and helping in any way that, that I can. And, you know, case in point was, um, you know, sharing some data from, from that system in Chile, um, you know, of M83, the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. And I just said, hey, you know, message me if you want to edit the data because I want to see how other people process and learn. And, you know, it, it occupied my whole weekend <laughs> because 50 people ended up messaging me saying, okay, yeah, let me get the data and I want to edit it. And, you know, now I got multiple new friends from Instagram on that. You know, one guy's in New Zealand, um, some cool guys in the U.S. here and, you know, some in Europe because they're just like, they 
they appreciated just spending some time on on you know some of the plane wave data and just seeing the the equipment um the processing that these people are doing is amazing um it's it's a lot you can learn from and and hang out hang out with people while you while you edit photos do you want to do you want to take some uh some questions from the um from the chat dustin yeah. Okay. Sure. There was. Yeah. There, yeah let's, uh, it. let's see. So, uh, this is from my YouTube channel, and dude, I don't know what kind of handle you've got there, but I can't even begin to pronounce it, so I'm not going to try. It. <laughs> but his question is, his. Que- <laughs> I mean, you should see it. It's all a bunch of vowels. I I really don't know how to say it. So, um, he he's asking, what are the deepest objects you have personally photographed, Matt? Uh, jeez. Um. I mean, it's probably going to be it's going to be a galaxy, but I think M eighty three. I mean, that's pretty deep. I forget how many millions of light years away it is offhand, but you know, it's going to be fun to get that CDK six hundred up and running for the plane wave side because then we won't be contingent upon waiting, you know, for for a night that a client's not using it, and then we could really um, think about you know if we get uh, folks wanting to image something really deep, you know, take it long integration over you know many nights and just see you know very far off galaxy that's um that will be something we could do but for me i think it might only be you know m83 or something like that um yeah you know x amount of millions of light years away i think but well, well I have to pull it up on my instagram and see well let me ask you this then i mean I, I i understand that it depends a lot on your location and the skies and and everything else but on average do you have an idea of the magnitude limit uh of the one meter can you get was it eighteen Not, or nineteen ninety two something like that? So, well, I guess you kind of basically it just like you said it depends on how many hours worth of photos that you take, right? Or are you talking I mean, about visually? I, I guess because well, I guess under what do I mean? I guess but like something on the order of a minute or two exposure. Can can you and you want to stack those up? Um, what, yeah. what would be the what would be a magnitude I, rough idea? Is it like eighteen or something <sighs> like that? Yeah, it's it's tough to tell offhand. I don't I don't have the numbers offhand. I'd have to check, but um, I was just pulling up the one galaxy. So I was I was remembering it's um, Centaurus A. That was the one I just posted the other day. Well, oh, that's very dim. Uh, yeah. Ten to sixteen million light years away, they they believe. But that yeah. one is unbelievably bright. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy bright, and yet it's that far away. It blows my mind. So it says it's about sixty thousand uh, light years across. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just wow. huge. But um, yeah, like you said, I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, the limiting mag of the scope offhand, but it just depends on how many hours worth of data that you take. What would you know, be? I'd have to calculate. What would be really fun, and the reason I asked that question is because a, a lot, you know, a plane wave would be a telescope that could do it. Uh, would certainly, it would certainly be part of its chops. Is if you could somehow get some of these uh, deep fields that Hubble yeah. had taken, some of the uh, uh, g- galaxy clusters that Hubble had taken, and maybe try and replicate uh, getting some uh, gravitationally lensed galaxies from behind. That would be so oh, awesome. But yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's up yeah. to The one meter might be, but it might be a little too small. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, that's the reason yeah. I was asking. Well, that. we have the two meter in design, so we, we just need to – we're working on some clients for that system. So, that I mean, that thing is going to be about 25 feet tall compared to the 11 feet tall for the one meter it's uh yeah it's going to be huge but that's i want to get one and put it down in chile because then you're taking advantage of of some great skies mm-hmm. um yeah but with that you're talking about tossing on probably some adaptive optics to really make use of it um you know because the focal length is going to be you know over ten thousand, well over 10 meters you know over ten thousand millimeters so it's going to be a a, a yeah. big um a big system but that would collect some serious you light. You don't want to roll that out and uh, take DSLR photography of the moon with it. <laughs> like you do well, that I literally would need finally, finally a motorized cart for that. I would hope because if I if I struggle to actually roll out an L three fifty on the rolling pier, yeah, I don't even want to know. <laughs> it would be like the thing that they carry the space shuttle with, kind of thing. Yeah, just throw the thing on a tripod and shoot it, man. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be so cool. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, oh, what are the questions you got? I like that we can have a more interactive podcast by streaming this, and we can have these questions 
coming in in real time. Awesome. I agree. Yeah. I th- yeah. I think you guys, this should be the, the new standard. I mean, you guys have done this for a while, but this, this seems natural and cool. So it's I, really, I yeah, like I love it too, man. We get the audience involved. Well, AE MIDI on Twitch is, uh, he's joking, but he's asking a question. Matt, what what company do you prefer, OPT or Plain Wave? OPT or Plain Wave? Uh, now, we're, now, we're, now we're casting jokes, I guess. Well, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we work so closely with OPT that, I mean, it, it's hard to tell. I've never worked for OPT, though, so it's tough to tell if I was an employee, one versus the other. But, you know, as well, you, colleagues, you I like have... both. Do you guys have ping pong tables or massage chairs or arcade machines? Oh well, yeah, that's next to the chocolate fountain <laughs> in the hot tub. The chocolate uh, fountain in the. <laughs> Do you guys have a, the chocolate fountain? <laughs> <laughs> the chocolate fountain. Oh, that would that would make my day if I was touring the new plane wave. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. So this is the two meter and the chocolate fountain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So you just, Never you mix the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't get any chocolate on the mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay well i got one more i got a serious question from uncle bill drew in on youtube he's uh he's asking i don't see how you get that kind of positional re- resolution talking about the the direct drive mounts i don't mm-hmm. see how you can get that kind of positional resolution without gearing unless the motor dynamic unless the motor diameter is building sized Oh, for the for the tracking accuracy, yes. the pointing accuracy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's it's actually in, incredibly easy. Um, but that's only because you have optical encoders. Optical encoders, you have a disc that has millions of etch marks. You can't even see it. It looks just, just like a gray bar because there's so many millions of these lines that are etched on this ring. And the, basically, this laser, this little system, the actual optical encoder, is reading all those millions of ticks. So that's the encoder tick resolution. That's how you get to the 0.05 to 0.15 arc second level tracking and it's direct drive. Um, gear-based systems, to my knowledge, will, well, I should say what they would never because I'm not an engineer to know if they ever could, but I would be very shocked if they could ever get down to that kind of tracking quality just due to machining tolerances when you machine metal. But of a gear, of a tooth mm-hmm. gear. So direct drives, you don't have gears that are machined. You're using uh, electromagnetic, um, you know, you're using magnetism to actually move a system. So you can send various amounts of power to the mount to move it. So that's probably a long-winded reason, but um, even the one meter, the one meter is same thing, very precise, just as uh, same exact tracking accuracy as the L350 because of the encoders on, on each axis. Okay. Well, the same guy who has an unpronounceable handle, you, you, you may have an unpronounceable handle, but you do have good questions. So I will ask this one. He's asking, can you ask the mix of installs between government, military, university, and private? Is there a sense of, is it an even mix? Do you do more of one kind than another? Uh, let's see. I mean, those are three main markets. So it's, I don't want to, I guess I'd split them into thirds, right? I mean, it's so about equal. It's all of them kind of share equal load. Um, and even government yeah. defense, they don't, government defense don't just buy one meters. They buy a lot of smaller systems and optical tubes and mounts mm-hmm. because of the, the direct drive capabilities for tracking satellites. So they'll even buy a lot of L350s, uh, the mounts just to track satellites, which is cool. So but uh, it's definitely a, an even mix. And that's what you need to do as a business is diversify. Because if we were set up on on d- defense, um, you know, what happens when government contracts don't come in or, you know, they furlough, you know, so you're definitely running into issues with that. We see the same kind of thing with um, with the pro services. Yeah, it's like you get and it, it's it's a fairly even mix, but it's all over the place with um, you know what's coming in and when because each one is seasonal to its yeah. own season, you know. And so when one lifts up, the other kind of usually they're getting their projects going, so they get their equipment, and now they're on the installs side of yep. it for a while, yep. and and they they all kind of balance out through the year. Well, it's a yeah, exactly. Uh, as a follow-up, Uncle Bill's going, I understand optical encoding, not unlike our optical mice, but getting that kind of resolution between motor poles, maybe with massive power usage. So I was wondering the same thing. That's why I kept saying stepper motors. I couldn't think of how you got yeah. from one pole to another. Uh, 
but maybe that's okay. What... So when you say pull, you're talking about like we we're talking about electricity. Then yeah, is that what you mean? Yeah, or from coils. Okay, okay. So basically, I mean, like I said, if you open up that Oreo, you have the uh, you have a race of magnets on one side and then you have copper coils on the other side and that's all sandwiched onto a bearing and then around that you will have the optical encoder the the disc the actual disc so the the, the l mounts draw extremely small amounts of power i mean you you run it off of 120 volt but the wattage that it's actually pulling is is only a few when it's maxing out slews in both axes so they're very efficient um motors that we've developed that actually don't have cogging either. So you don't have these, um, these typical motor, uh, issues, especially for us, cause that would ruin the tracking if you did, okay. but the motor tuning is what gives you the, the performance. It's, uh, PID, um, you know, motor tuning is basically, that's how you, um, yield awesomely low tracking quality with, with a with a direct drive motor that our software engineer did uh he taught himself how to do all that it's incredible <laughs> wow that is cool my yeah, uh, you have incredible engineers there at plane wave you have the two kevins and they both oh my gosh are yeah. so incredible yeah. like so impossibly yeah. good at what they do it's you scary know, awesome. um they're savants i mean kevin iverson yeah. is probably the smartest guys i've ever met um, yeah. and he is so down to earth and able to teach as well. That's difficult to find. Um, you know, he's patient. <laughs> He'll walk you through everything on a whiteboard. And, uh, it's, he really is, um, a, a special employee for sure. Uh, you know, for plane wave and we're honored to have him and same with Kevin, I, and the engineering side. I mean, he's, he's the one that developed the L map. Right. I mean, he saw right. a need yeah. because welding, making a fork mount is so difficult because when you weld metal, it's going to bend. So mm -hmm. if you have That's you right. know, a fork, basically, you're going to those things will shift. So aligning the optical tube with that, that's that was the simplest decision to just swap it, go to one L because welding it, you're not going to get this this odd uh, alignment issue between two forks as you would. So and, you know, no meridian flips. So it will just track all across Zenith, across Meridian. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I love talking to both of them. And, and you're right. Uh, Iverson is so patient, man. I, when I have the really complicated computer problems, that's who I'll call, like with our yeah. observatories, because yeah. I feel like there is no there is no question he can't answer. It's amazing. I've asked him questions he should have had uh. zero reason to know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just makes something up and then somehow he like yeah. just figures it out. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. the last installs on before all the travel shut down was it at uh, Modesto Junior College in California, and it was I was the last. It was the third install I've done in a week, so it was wrapping it up and. He, um, they needed, it, they had one of the first CDK 700s and, um, it even still had an IRF 90 as the tertiary to rotate the, the, the tertiary mirror, which, you know, is hilarious, but a great idea, but the, um, <laughs> their computer crashed and they didn't have a backup. So back then, uh, Kevin worked on the system and had to write a custom driver for their dome and all this stuff. And of course the computer crashed, they didn't back it up. And he was able to, while I was there working on the stuff, he rewrote the camera, the, the driver for the dome and all the stuff just on the fly. And it's, I mean, there's no way I would have been, I would have been just sitting there dead in the water if it wasn't for him. And, um, so it's, that speaks to yeah, the engineering services side of plane wave that within a few hours, uh, very custom, um, you know, work and assistance can be done if someone needs it. Yeah. It's amazing. All right. Well, I think that is, um, we are approaching our, our time here. Um, do you want to, uh, do you have any questions from your um, Twitch feed? No, I think we're good. I would like for you to uh, let people know, though, how, how can people find your work? How can they follow? Yeah, tell us about, doing? tell us about your social media presence. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just at Matt Dieterich. Um, I don't know if you guys need the spelling and all that stuff, but I, ha I have uh, your name here on the video part and I'll make sure to spell yeah. it out. Uh, so I'm, I'm very active on, on Instagram and I've been slowly starting to actually make, um, you know, a lot more YouTube videos. So my goal is, uh, to make some videos and help promote, uh, you know, education and outreach so people can go learn how to set up equipment and do astrophotography. So I have a, a laundry list 
of uh, how-to videos to make for YouTube. So definitely uh, feel free to subscribe if you guys want to follow along. And if there's something specific you want to learn about with editing or with equipment setup, then definitely shoot me a message and um, I'll add it to the list. But um, yeah, Instagram and, and YouTube, uh, those are definitely the, the, the ones I'm on the most. And uh, I'm building a, a new website for uh, my night sky photography workshops. So for people that are interested in traveling to dark sky locations, I'll be leading workshops to Chile, mm -hmm. to national parks in the US um, in other locations to just good dark skies to teach astrophotography and landscape photography. So I'll be putting that uh, new website live within, uh, well, by the end of the month. So uh, that's my photography side that uh, I just want to educate and teach people and get them passionate about, about their own work and share in the outdoors. So a lot of it's, uh, you know, nightscapes and uh, even um, prime focus, all the good telescope imaging stuff. Yeah. Just the, just the night sky experience is worth the ticket. I mean, it is worth just mm -hmm. getting there because some of these skies are, unbelievable especially the ones in chile so i highly recommend that yeah. for sure um well matt let's do more together man i absolutely love what you're doing i love the mission even more so um any way i can help with that or opt can help with that you know we're on board we're already doing a lot together on the plane wave opt side yeah. but uh what you're doing personally i think is very important work and, and you're doing it very well man so thank you for everything you're contributing to the community it uh it's very important and uh you're doing a wonderful job absolutely no, Thanks, you guys man. uh yeah just uh happy to share it and you guys as well you're doing awesome work and this is the way we uh keep the industry moving forward exactly yep. all right Agreed. all right well we will cut it there i want to thank you all so much for watching and listening and on behalf of dustin gibson and matthew Derrick, i want to thank you all so much for listening and as always keep looking up Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. There. Okay. Now, Matt, before you go anywhere, uh, in your Zencaster uh, window, you should see that you are uploading. Let that upload finish. That's the local recording that it made on your laptop or computer. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. 30%. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then once we have that, you're free to leave that particular tab. And uh, cool. I'm still streaming, so I should probably sign off the stream. I just want to say, though, thank you guys for watching on both of our channels with uh, both Deep Astronomy on YouTube and Gibson Picks on Twitch. Uh, Dustin, you want to say a couple words about what's going on with Twitch for those of, that are watching on my channel that don't know? Yeah, absolutely. So we are uh, streaming on Twitch every single night at 7 p.m. under Gibson Picks. So that's at Gibson Picks on Twitch. Um, and soon the name is going to be changed to Clear Skies Network, and you're going to have Mr. Tony Darnell there yep, as well. That's right. I'll be there. Um, you know, but we are doing virtual star parties every single night where we open up the, the roofs, run the telescopes. We let other people run them. So one night we had someone from Pakistan running one scope and someone from Boston running another 12-year-old kid running exposures. Uh, it's, it's really, really cool, and there's no locality about it. You can... No matter where you are, you can come out and it's free. So think of it just as a virtual star party. You can hang out with like-minded astronomy people. And uh, we cover everything. We cover processing with APOD recipients, you know, imaging. And any questions you have about gear. But it's just a big community of people talking about astronomy. So it's really, really cool. It really is cool. And if you and if you join tonight, uh, you, might, you might see Fraser K. And he might be stopping by. Uh, to say hi to Dustin, and if I can get there, I'm hoping I'm gonna I'm gonna bomb the, the, the I will bomb the chat at least, <laughs> so I'll be there as well. No, no, no you're gonna be in the video, man. Come <laughs> hang out with me and Fraser. All right, I'll, will be there. I'm gonna yeah, yeah, I'm gonna rush out. to get Matt, there. Same thing to you, man. If you're around, come hang out. Yeah, he'll All right, on, he'll send you, you a link, and you're in. Pull so. you into the Zoom. Yeah. Yep. It's All no right. different than this. It's literally identical. <laughs> yeah, yes, pretty much. Is, uh, <laughs> this alone could be full time work. I mean, this is this is cool, guys. I love it. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. so sweet okay well thanks matt and uh yeah well I look forward to talking to you again and maybe future podcasts and or streams so good work dude. for sure all right Sounds thanks good. guys all right i'm gonna and stop you're always, the stream. you're always welcome on the twitch channel yep all right guys see you guys, see you guys later i'm gonna stop the streams all right all righty later guys take it easy all right I'm going to jump off, Tony, because I have to go live on my Instagram yeah, now. Yeah, um, I, will, I will join you. 20 minutes. In just, yeah, in 20 minutes, I'll join you. Okay? Perfect. All right, see you then. Sounds good, man. See ya.